Take your seats. Although if you need to get up, we won't, you know, hold you hostage or anything. A big hi, how are you? Welcome to the Casey Race and Equity Initiative, starting the conversation. We're so happy and delighted that you're here tonight. My name is Dia Wall. I'm an anchor and a reporter at 41 Action News here in the city. And when they called me to say, hey, would you mind coming out to do this? I was like, I would love to. I think this is important. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about, not only as a journalist, but as a citizen of Kansas City. And so we're delighted you're here as well. You're gonna have a really unique opportunity tonight. We're going to hear from Mayor Sly James. You'll also get to participate, not just sit and listen, but take part in a race and equity training that's going to be led by Paku Her and a public health official named Dr. Sarah Martin. They're coming with real numbers, hard data, actionable things that we can do to make the city a better place and address some of these issues. Now, I have a feeling that all of you are just as interested as we are, or you wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you. How about we give yourselves a round of applause for taking part in this important conversation. So to the house business, shall we? You've got some note cards on your seats. Those are for you to write down questions that you may want to ask of our presenters. Things that come to mind, if something bubbles up during the training and you're like, you know what? I'd like to know this. That's an opportunity for you to write that down. We have people who are going to be circulating and picking those up so you can take part in the conversation that way. If you're watching on channel two, hi. We're happy to have you as well, or on our live stream. Thank you for joining us. You can tweet your questions to the man himself, at Mayor Sly James, Nadia Wall, at Mayor Sly James. He's the man you want to tweet for that. We've got a lot of people who are going to go through those questions as well, so we can make sure we engage our digital audience too. And then if you just want to come up, hang out with me, I'll have a microphone, I'll be roaming around, and you can ask your question for those of you who are sitting here with us tonight in the Kauffman Foundation Conference Center. So, back to the house rules. One. Let's be respectful, okay? This is not an easy topic for a lot of people to talk about. And your experience is likely a lot different from some of the people sitting right around you. We wanna respect each other. Everyone's opinions, life experience adds value and it's important to our conversation tonight. Number two, turn off your phones, let's put them away. This is not a conversation that you can probably tweet in 140 characters. Oh, we got 280, we got the upgrade, but even then, that's not enough. So we want to make sure that we're engaged, that we're present, and that we're getting the most that we can from this event tonight. And then finally, there are going to be members of the media here, my colleagues. People may share some personal stuff. We want to be respectful of that. We want to treat it with a little bit of TLC. Finally, a big thank you to the Kauffman Foundation for opening these beautiful doors and allowing us to come in tonight. We should give them a round of applause, everybody. At this time, please help me welcome Miles Sandler, Director of Education and Engagement here at the Kauffman Foundation. Welcome. A welcome. I could welcome you to the Kauffman Foundation Conference Center, a place where thousands, nonprofits, Leaders and community members connect a year, but that is not why we're here. So instead, I could welcome you for coming out tonight, taking a moment to have a courageous conversation with our many neighbors, but that's not the right welcome either. Instead, I would like to welcome you to step into hope, not hope that is sweet and simple and found on cards, but a hope that is bold, powerful, ready to act, but also willing to actively listen. Hope that dreams big, grounded in historical fact and present day truth to ensure that our future generations can't tackle different challenges. See, our focus here at Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation aspires to eliminate barriers so that every person, regardless of their background, can take risk, achieve success, and give back to their communities. To do that, we strive to work together with communities in education and entrepreneurship to create uncommon solutions that empower people to shape their futures. Yet, we know we need to do better. 
The Kauffman Foundation welcomes you to push our thinking and challenge our assumptions. We welcome you to reach out, and we are committed to reach back. I will be physically here for the entire event, and if there's anyone in the community that wants to just chat, connect, I'd be happy to do so. We recognize that we can learn together to develop uncommon solutions. And with that, we welcome to hear some of the, we want you to hear some of the voices that has been shaping our perspective and holding us accountable to live out our mission. Thank you. Somewhat frightening. The schism between the haves and have nots is growing larger. There's a disconnect between those who are being the active change agents on a daily basis and those who are talking about it and theorizing about it. Right now, a lot of people feel like they're being left behind. We have got to do better. We have got to close the gap in minority <laughs> achievement. People actually don't want to acknowledge that there is an equity um, within the city. When there's a denial of reality, when leadership is unwilling to, to be humble in the, in the sense of, of learn and listen, uh, I don't think there's much room for hope. The elephant in the room is segregation, oppression, marginalization. And we cannot sit here and act as if it doesn't exist. It's a virus and we have to, we have to completely eliminate that virus. I don't want our community to be uh, what is it, hoodwinked. Uh, I don't want them to be deceived in any way. I want to make sure that our community understands that even if we don't have the answers, we're working toward the answers. It's really about being willing to truly learn. And sometimes that means unlearning some of the things that you, you think you know. The most challenged space in Kansas City is in people's minds and their own self-segregation. What can we do now that is going to address this, to put our children in a better place? We have to change our, our way of thinking, uh, our way of just acclimating to the environment and to new communities. Hopefully what that allows for is the type of progressive, the type of evolutionary uh, decision-making uh, where you make new mistakes. You don't make the same ones you either made or that someone else made before you. We know that when everybody achieves, when everybody contributes, the outcomes are better for everybody. It's a matter of us being courageous enough to have the conversations and to bring everybody to the table and say, okay, we recognize that there's a lot of pain, but how do we come together now and move forward? The future to me is a place where um, people of color are at an equal standing in the world and they feel like they matter. They feel like they have um, a place where in a world that uh, systemic racism no longer exists. But we have got to be committed to keeping that hope alive. One more time for the Kauffman Foundation. At this time, we are going to welcome the leader of your great city, Mayor Sly James. Good evening. I want to start by saying thanks to everybody, but I want to say thanks first to my staff who worked tremendously hard uh, to make this happen. So Juan Ramiro Sarmiento, Stan Juan. <laughs> Jessica Ann is someplace around here somewhere. Jessica, there she's back in the back. <laughs> Laura Swinford is around somewhere. Um, Jim Giles, uh, Larissa Western Kirchner, Julie Holland, Luan Liu, and Joni Wickham, my chief of staff. They have worked a lot harder on this than I certainly have. Uh, they've been responsible for wrangling everybody and wrangling everything and coming up with a program that I would then decimate with red ink and they would go back and do again. <laughs> I also want to thank the Kauffman Foundation for once again inviting us into this center and allowing us to use it. Uh, I want to thank our partners, 
uh, the Kansas City Health Department, as well as the Community Alliance for Racial Equity, known as CARE. CARE is an organization, a new organization, that works to build community of stakeholders, activists, organizers, trainers, educators around this uh, common vision of racial equity in this city. Uh, they're a critical partner with the city moving forward with this mission and in these efforts. We also are joined by other critical community partners who are engaged in this space. Organizations like the Open Table, the Race Project of KC, the Cultural Competency Collective, Stand Up for Racial Justice and the Poor People's Campaign. I would urge all of you at the end of this program to meet the folks of these organizations out in the hall at their tables and connect with them. Find out what they do. It may be something that you are particularly suited or very much, much wanting to do yourself, and you can hook up with them and, and hopefully get some things done. They've been starting this conversation around the city for quite some time. Uh, they've been critical to getting the city to where it is at the current state, and they are also critical to the fact that we are now able to sit here with over 300 people in this building watching and participating in this, in this program. So I want to thank them for doing the work that is necessary to bring this subject out into the light so that we can all discuss it. I also want to thank all of you for making the effort to actually get here tonight. This is a very, very heartwarming situation to see so many people spend their evening with us in order to have this discussion that a lot of people might feel is uncomfortable. Uh, all of you may have different reasons for being here tonight. Some of you may be actually engaged in this field. Some of you might want to be engaged but don't know how. And some of you may just simply be curious as to what we're doing here and how we're going to do it. The main thing is, is that you showed up. That's what really matters, is that you are, in fact, here. Now, it's pretty clear to me, and I don't know if anybody came here with this expectation, but I do not think that we are going to solve the problem of racial inequality in the next 90 minutes. I could be wrong. And if we are able to do that, I would urge all of us to stay here, enter into a contract, because we can then sell whatever we've done around the world and all become quite rich. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, we're not going to fix the system, and we're not going to alleviate our own prejudices. But what we will have done is together we will have taken a step forward, and that's very, very important. It's a step towards learning a common language. It's a step towards learning how racial inequality affects our community and how it's shaped our society. It's a common step towards understanding how these systems have advantaged some and disadvantaged others. It's even more importantly, a step that we are taking together. We should know by now, we should know by now that whatever we do together, we are going to have a much greater chance at succeeding at. The big issues cannot be solved by one individual. One individual can, however, get others to help, and working together, they can make a major effort towards solving major problems. I'm not going to tell you this is going to be easy. It's not going to be. If it was easy, we'd have done it a long time ago. I will tell you that it may be emotional for some. It may be challenging for others. It might be something that requires us to overcome our own personal biases and obstacles and examine our own belief systems. But the fact that you're here means that you're willing to try. And it's going to be worth it at the end. Because in communities like ours, where one individual gains, the entire community gains. That's something that we should be proud of. So contrary to what we've been taught, this is not a zero-sum game. So if you would be so kind, since you have made the extraordinary effort to be here on a weeknight, away from your families, away from the ball game, or whatever else you might have ordinarily been doing, you've made that effort. Let's make the full commitment to be open, to listen, to commit, to engage for the next 90 minutes. We've already asked you to turn off your phones. I still want to remind you to do that. Don't be distracted by them. I'm asking us all to work together. I'm asking us all to start to get right now to make a commitment that we are going to take the first step towards trying to alleviate or lessen the racial inequities that absolutely, that absolutely plagued this community and have held us back. And if this room full of people will make that commitment 
And if we will then do something, I told Dia the other day, I'm not a person who likes to go to meetings and talk. I don't mind going to meetings and talking, but at the end of the day, it's gotta be some action. If we're willing to take action, or tired to do something about this, this city will be better for those efforts and you will have been a part of making it so. So thank you all, thank you very much for being here and let's get to work. Thanks, Mayor James. Now, would you like to meet your presenters? First up is Paku Her. She's principal of Ching Development Group. It's a consulting firm that does lectures and workshops and transformative leadership coaching and organizational and grassroots strategy. So it's all designed to build racial equity and create systems of change. She has more than 20 years of anti-racism and equity training. She's run a program with the Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training. She's born and raised in the Midwest, takes great pride in representing Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders living in the nation's midsection, and she believes that there are valuable stories about people of color in the most rural areas of our country. So, in addition to that, I got to meet her for the first time yesterday. I'm known to go off script. And she is one of the most vibrant and engaging, authentic women I have ever met. And I don't say that often. This is very true. It will really be a treat for you to hear from her tonight. Paku her. And also joining her will be Dr. Sarah Martin, Deputy Director of the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department. She oversees the department's initiatives to influence social and economic policies throughout the city that help shape some of those health equities, make the system more fair and work better for all of us. Dr. Martin has a Master of Public Policy and a Master of Public Health, plus a PhD in Public Policy from the University of California, Berkeley. She was previously an Assistant Professor of Health Services Research at UMKC, the Block School of Management, Research Coordinator at University of California, San Francisco, and a Policy Analyst for the County of Alameda, California. Please help me welcome Dr. Martin. Good evening, everybody. Sarah's going to take the stage in a little bit. She told me she didn't want to hog all the limelight. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm Paku. It's really wonderful to see this room full. I have done several um, anti-racism conferences, actually. When I was running the training program with Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training, we had our annual conference here in this space, partly because I was pregnant and my coworkers didn't want me to travel. Um, so it's really wonderful to be in this space again with new people having a very similar conversation as those I've had here before. So I'm just pleased that this room is full. In case you didn't know, there's also overflow rooms packed with people and folks watching on Channel 2, as Dia said. So it's really, really exciting. Um, before we jump in tonight, I want to just ask two questions, like a super quick poll. How many of you have ever had a conversation about race that didn't go well? <laughs> Oh good, I'm not alone. How many of you had conversations that went so off the rails that you're like, oh, I'm never doing that again? <laughs> Please don't ever make me have this conversation again. Good, so I, I like to find out like, who are my kin. I'm glad that I'm not alone. Um, I want you all to know that the goal for tonight is not to do that. <laughs> the goal for tonight is to figure out a way for us as a community to have a conversation about race that helps us see it for what it is, that isn't about blaming and shaming people, but could we just name what is real about race in, in our society, and not just in our society, but in our community, and build the tools together and the skill together, and maybe to have a different kind of experience. One where we can recognize one another's humanity, we can recognize the different places where we sit in the landscape of race, and then if we can come together with some shared language, it's more likely that we'll find some strategies that will work. So that's the goal for tonight. So thank you for the quick poll. All right, so a couple of things I'd like to do before we continue is just to be super clear. The mayor uh, did say to us a little bit about how we got here, what's been happening, what we're gonna do tonight, and what it means for you. So like super re quick recap. Um, I am a, I've been a trainer doing anti-racism work for over two decades. And I always tell the rooms that I'm in where I'm about to do a training or have some kind of a strategic conversation about race, I always say, you took the time to be here, we should do a flight check just to make real sure that this is where you want to go. <laughs> because if you're, like I always say, if you're getting on a plane 
and you're supposed to go to San Francisco, and you think you're in Boston, but you're actually starting in DC, you're just never gonna get to San Francisco. So let's just be really clear about where we're starting and why. Right, so we came together, you, you signed up for this lecture tonight, this workshop, this community conversation that's called Starting the Conversation. We are very clear that the conversation has been happening all over the city in lots of different ways. And this is a really great effort by the mayor to figure out could we pull together all of these disparate or pockets of conversations and get people on the same page and figure out is there a common strategy to make big impact in Kansas City. It doesn't mean we're going to stop doing the work in the health department or stop doing the grassroots work in order to transition everybody to another thing. The idea is could we get everybody doing their thing to become a chorus, to be, work in concert. That's the big idea for tonight. So you're going to get a little bit from me that's going to feel like a training. Because we thought, well, if people want to come together and do something, we should figure out if we're in the same container. Right? So those of you who raised your hands, which was most everybody, who has ever been in a conversation about race that didn't go well, my assessment, anecdotally, is that most of those conversations don't go well because people use the word racism and they mean totally different things. So what we want to do is get everybody on the same page, at least for the next 90 minutes, and then say, what do we see together about our city? What do we see together about the places where we have access? Maybe you'll say, what do I see about myself in a way that I had never seen before? So that's what we're going to do tonight. And then Sarah's going to help us look at that and say, OK, then how does that translate into what's happening systemically? What do we see particularly around health, health disparities, all of the things that happen to our bodies in our communities? when we look at institutional racism. So that's gonna be really good too. So for you, I hope what this will mean is that one, maybe you'll, you will be somebody who has a new skill or a new analysis of racism tonight that you didn't have before. If you are somebody who already has an institutional analysis, then what I hope too for everybody including you is that what this will mean for you is a different kind of community conversation. The co you get to be part of something that's coalescing in the community in a way that I don't think it's ever coalesced before. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not a lifer in Kansas City, but I've been living here 13 years, and this feels different to me than it did 13 years ago. And I'm really excited about that. <laughs> so, other quick flight check. I always tell folks, because I'm a community organizer, I'm a grassroots organizer, so I'm always saying, what do I want to give people? Like, I want to give people good content and a good lecture and all that stuff, but I want to give you something that you will use. I want to give you something that will feel like an outcome for you when you leave this space. So I want you to know that you'll get a chance to meet some of the people sitting around you. So some of you may be sitting with people you know already, so maybe it's okay, you don't have to talk to somebody new. I never force people to talk to somebody new in a big space like this. But if you're willing to stretch a little bit and turn the other way to the person you don't know, you could get a chance to meet somebody in the community. And then this is the piece that I was just talking about. We want to clarify a collective commitment, which means what is our shared definition and framework? You know, some of you know already that the mayor is going to be doing a series of conversations, progressive conversations about race. But each of those conversations for the next several months is going to be built on the definition that we're using tonight. So I want you to know this is our community framework for this. The third thing is then we're going to say, okay, what's the data say? So for data nerds, it's great. And if you're not a data nerd, you're going to like it anyway. So we're going to talk about that. And then there's going to be a way for you to talk to us about how to get involved. And I am serious. I really support the mayor in this. The people who are sitting in the hallway at those tables, talk to them. There's all different kinds of folks out there. Consultants, trainers, community organizers, folks doing nonprofit and advocacy work. Connect with those people and figure out what makes sense for you to support you. Whether your biggest challenge is the kitchen table conversation that you're afraid to have with somebody in your family about race all the way to like, oh, there's like some racial inequity happening at my work, and I need to figure out how to deal with this. Like all, and everything in between. There are folks who can help with that. Super. So, now, I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor. Now, this is a really big room. It's gonna get loud, so I apologize for the people who are introverts. I apologize for people for whom noise is a challenge. I mean that quite seriously, it will get loud in here. But it's only for a few minutes just so you can turn to your neighbor and share with them what is your name and your pronoun, that is, what is your gender or identity, um, like for, my, for me, for example, mine is she and her. You might be they or there or he or him, whatever that is, so that people know how to identify you. Your name and your pronoun, and then what excites you the most about a community-wide conversation about racial equity? What is most exciting, makes you most hopeful, whatever that is? 
So it's going to be super fast, two minutes. Each person's going to get one minute. So like, you know, if you decide you're going to break the rules and get in a group of four, you're not all going to be able to share. <laughs> but two minutes, turn to each other and just answer these questions briefly. Hi. I go by she and her. That's my pronoun. Okay, great. Um, I'm excited because I work for the city, and so there's a lot of times we go to community events and like we don't have a shared definition of what racism is or what oppression is. It makes it really difficult for us to try to do the policy work we want to do without that shared definition. I know exactly and, how that feels. You know, so I'm yeah. Constantly yeah. Using the word African American, which I understand they don't like. Right. Right. And I, I can say they because that's one that's behind me. Yeah. That's my husband. My partner is also no. black. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. It's a good organizer trick. OK, so I wish that we could hear from every single person in the room, but we can't. And we have all of our friends in the overflow room and all the friends watching on channel two, so we can't do that. But I hope that in talking with the person next to you, you might have heard something that sounded different than maybe what you were excited about, and maybe it invited you to consider another piece of the work that could be exciting. If you talk to somebody that you know, maybe somebody that you've known a long time, perhaps you learned something new about their own self-interest and why they're here, it's just to figure out for you, at least one person, who else is invested here and why. Because I think for any one of us, it's important to want to care about ending racism because there's all these big meta giant problems of racism. Oppression is terrible. Systemic institutional racism is awful. All of that is real and true. And when we start creating strategies or trying to create change, the thing that will really hold you and me at the table is if you know really why it matters to you. What your self-interest is is a really important thing. Not just because this is an interesting conversation that the mayor is having but because you have a vested interest in being here. And you know that every other person in this room also has a vested interest in being here. That's the best of organizing. So thank you for taking the time to do that. What I'd like to have us do next now is move into talking specifically about racism and what it is. So this is going to feel like breaking all the rules. I'm just going to ask you to shout things out. I want to know. Yes, with some, you know, like, we can manage ourselves, right? We're grown. Um, I want to know, when you think about the word racism, what does it mean to you? How do you define racism? A word or a very brief phrase that helps you define racism, when you think about that. Discrimination, inequality, prejudice, judgment. I heard someone say power. Somebody said white supremacy. Ignorance. Say that again. It's a divide. Fear. Fear. Did somebody say skin? Like skin color? I might have heard that. A sickness. Hate. Hate. Deadly. 
a stereotype. Okay, so I want you to hear, I, I was listening to that, and you know, like, thank you for suffering through people talking. And I, I come from a really big family where we talk over each other, so I'm really used to it. <laughs> I also come from a family, my two children, if anybody follows um, astrological signs, I'm an Aries, my children are Leos, and my poor husband is a Virgo, so like, you can imagine what it sounds like in our house. And he's always like, why are you bickering? And we're like, we're just talking. We're just talking. This is how we talk. So I'm really used to that. So I want to tell you what I heard. And I know not everybody had a chance to weigh in on what your definition of racism is. But when I was listening to all of you, I heard some kind of different answers. I heard answers like prejudice, bias, hate, the kinds of things that I would categorize as like, oh, these are like how an individual person might express whatever bias, racial bias or racial racism they might be living into. And then I heard things like white supremacy, power. I heard somebody say systems or systemic, which is a slightly different answer. That's not necessarily the same as my individual prejudice, right? So I want you to hear this. Like if I'm walking down the street and somebody calls me a derogatory name, that might hurt. That might not feel so great. But that doesn't determine whether or not I have a place to live, or I can go to school, or my elders will receive culturally competent health care. It doesn't determine those things. It's still awful. But that individual person shouting something at me on the street is not the same as people being racially profiled when they're driving around. Right? So I want you to hear the distinction. So that's my first reflection, and even just the few answers that came out. My second reflection is I'm pretty sure that there are as many definitions of racism as there are people in this room. So remember when I said earlier, this conversation goes off the rails a lot. Oftentimes, because folks, even good-hearted, well-intentioned folks, get into a room and didn't decide and didn't agree on what is our framework for talking about race, and then they start talking about race and it's a hot mess because one person means um, you know, inequitable access to education, and one, people, one person means cultural appropriation, and one person means, well, it's all these horrible racial epithets. One person means it's your, you know, the, the, the prejudices you might carry in your heart. All of those things are different parts of racism, but then everybody gets together and tries to have a conversation, and it generally doesn't work. At the very best, people are talking past each other. At the very worst, people are at odds with each other. So I think that there, can't, there is a way to solve this, that there is a way for us to say, what would it mean for us to have a common definition of racism? What would it mean for us to have a definition of racism that becomes our common framework? That becomes the community commitment to how we do racial equity here in Kansas City? Because a, fra like a definition is not just a bunch of words. A definition is the framework or the, the glasses you put on that everybody wears and we all wear the same prescription. You hear what I'm saying? That that is the tool. So when I said to you, I want to give you something to use, it's not just that I want to give you some hot information about racism. That was really great. I learned all kinds of stuff about critical race theory. That's actually, I'm less interested in that. I am more interested in giving you a pair of glasses that then we all wear so we can see the world the same way and then make assessments based on where we are in the landscape. That's the idea and that's our commitment. Because without that, we're kind of in trouble. So. Come on, clicker. So these are very basic pieces before I give you what will be a, a, a super simple definition. The first is that when we define racism, it's clear I've already said, we need a common definition. Some way to be in the same room so we're not screaming at each other from different places of the house. First of all, racism is not just individual bigotry and prejudice. People can express racist, you know, all kinds of bias. But that's not the same. And I would hazard to say that if you were living in the United States, socialized around race in the United States at all, that everybody has racial bias or a racial prejudice. White people and people of color, everybody. It's an equal opportunity illness. Everybody can get it. But it's not the same as racism, right? We need to know that racism is actually slightly more than that. There's something, there's another missing component. And somebody said, okay, like there's personal prejudice, but I heard people saying things like power and institutions. That's what's needed here for us to think about a holistic view of what race is. That it's race prejudice when it's combined with your society's, the power of your society's institutions, that's when it turns into racism. 
it doesn't mean that people can't be awful to each other around with racial prejudice. But when we talk about racism, particularly systemic racism, there's something slightly different. So here's what I want you to see. Super simple. It is amazing how simple the equation is. In a country that is obsessed with race, we don't talk about race ever. In a country that is obsessed with race, we do a lot to pretend like we know, we don't know how to define it. All you have to do is scratch the surface a little bit and then the definition becomes pretty clear. Right, so this is a way to imagine in a mathematical equation, and this is not, I don't own this, there are lots of groups that work with this, People's Institute, um, REI, Crossroads, lots and lots of groups, local groups like Surge showing up for racial justice are using this definition to help people see racism holistically. That it's a combination of individual prejudice, racial prejudice, and the power or the misuse of systemic power by institutions and systems in society. So that means that like, as an Asian American, I can have my own biases, uh, things that are pretty benign. Like, I think rice is the best food and everybody should eat it forever. <laughs> like that is clearly a bias in the truest sense of the word, but it's fairly harmless. To something as malignant and hurtful as I think Asian Americans are superior and we are smarter than everybody else, we are uh, prettier than everybody else, and everybody should be, live by, that, by those rules. But even if I believe really hurtful, awful things like that, it doesn't become racism unless my society forces everybody to live by my racial prejudices. So I want you to hear the distinction. It's both holistic and distinct between individual and systemic power. For how many people is this sort of a new way of thinking about it? It's totally cool if it is. Great. So this is part of getting us onto the same page. Now, I want to just have you turn to one another. You're going to do a little what I call uh, turn and talks. You're going to get loud again. A little elbow conversation. And just turn to one another and reflect on this definition. What works for you? What questions do you have? Is something about this affirming for you? Is it really new for you? That's okay if it's totally new for you. We came here with the purpose of getting onto the same page. So I'm gonna give you three minutes, not a lot of time, just to turn, wet your palates with some conversation, and then when we come back, I'll take just a handful of, of reflections from people, two or three, just two or three. But turn to each other and just digest for a little bit.
One more minute. One more minute in your small groups. One minute. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. If you can hear me, clap four times. I can always tell how engaged a group is by how many claps you have to do. So this is good. This is good. I mean, you know, you could have done 10, but you did four, so that's great. Um, so I said I would like to hear from a couple of folks just Give us a very quick taste of what emerged in your conversation debriefing this definition. So if you would raise your hands. Well, I think we have some folks with microphones. Or you can just be loud or I'll repeat what you have to say. I see a hand right here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And Juan's got a microphone you can use. When you were given instructions, I took it to be racism. <laughs> that you were telling us what not to do, but yet you turned around and told us what to do. So that I was being racist by asking you to talk about well, the Well, I mean, you, you used the example of your family, and you used the example if you told us to eat rice, and your culture would be this and that, and that you wouldn't do that. However, if someone with power said to do this, then it would be racism, and then you turn around and told us to do this. Did other people experience me that way? I'm just curious. So it was really just, I appreciate you sharing that as your experience. The, the thing for you all was that it was just me asking you to just say what you thought about the definition. Maybe it was an interesting thing to talk about my anecdote, which is totally fine. Y'all can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, but I appreciate that reflection. I see another hand over here. Yes. Excellent. Yes. So what was just shared here in this row was that we hope we can get over ourselves. Like, it's time. We are tired of this. We want to do something about this. I could not agree with you more. And I think for folks, I am somebody who, um, at 41, is relatively young in racial equity work. Um, and I recognize that there have been folks who have been doing this for generations. Not just, and folks often say, I think, in the racial equity movement and racial justice work, oh, since the civil rights movement. People have been doing this since 1492, let's be honest. So I'm really aware that who I am is real new. And that like, there's a, we need that sense of urgency. We need that sense of urgency. We need a sense of saying, OK, like, we have to get moving on this. I, I'm not going to say we haven't made progress. We have in many, many ways, and yet not in many other ways. Um, that said, I'm also somebody who is a strategist. I want to know that in my community, if we have this sense of urgency, then how will we best channel our collective energy to produce the outcome that we want? But any, any good organizer worth their salt, any person who's invested in long-term change worth their salt will ask that question. So yes, come with our righteous anger. Come with our frustration. Come with the desire for needing something to happen tomorrow because yes, we should have strategy and people are literally dying today. And so there's a, there's a real struggle and a real tension between that. And the idea, I think, is to figure out, could, do we even have the basic skills to be able to navigate the tension? And I would say, maybe, maybe not. So even starting with a place, in a place where we say, we just need to share some language to help us get on the same page is of the utmost import in order for us to then figure out, then how do we most effectively channel the anxiety, the anger, the frustration, and maybe cultivate a little hopefulness in the middle of it, because that's fairly important too. So thank you for that reflection. So I, I just, 
thank you for, to both of you for sharing those pieces. And I'm sure that there were lots of other conversations happening for folks. I really want to hold that, like, I don't expect that this, I don't anticipate and did not anticipate that this would be a new definition for some people. And I also anticipated that for some it would be. So I would just want to hold all of that and all of us coming to this conversation with our own investments to say, okay, come into the same room. What do we see? What do we know if we stand in the same room? Um, you know, there's, when I was talking with the mayor as we were preparing for this evening, one of the things that was really important for us was to be very clear about the fact that none of us just fell out of a tree and had like been socialized by race. Like, the, none of us were just born and all of a sudden like, oh wow. Or like today you saw something or you saw Dia on TV last night, we're like, oh, I never thought about race before. I guess I'll go to this thing. <laughs> this, what is this race you speak of? Like nobody's like that, okay? <laughs> because that's why I always say nobody fell out of a tree. This whole construct was historically created. And that's what Sarah's gonna help us see too. We can look at an example of racial inequity you know, a lot, a lot of what's been in the news recently um, around maternal health is the rate at which black mothers die at much higher rates than other mothers, white mothers and other mothers of color. We don't have all the data about native women, but like this is a huge story. And it has huge impact on black communities, black families, and it's totally about race. So that's one example, but it's not just like, oh, black mothers just started dying. That isn't what happened. There was a whole system that came into place in which there were mitigating factors for generations that have contributed to this outcome. That's how systems get shaped. That's how systemic outcomes happen. So that's a very clear example. I was talking with somebody too about um, the suburbs, because um, this person's like, I don't know, maybe I should move to the suburbs, maybe I shouldn't move to the suburbs. I'm really concerned, like are the suburbs as diverse as I need them to be for my kids. We we're having this whole conversation and then it led to this conversation about how the suburbs were created. And it wasn't just that people, again, just fell out of a tree and built their McMansions. That isn't what happened. We can look at things like the GI Bill. We can look at clear historical factors that contributed to what happened to urban flight, what people often historians call white flight from urban centers out to the suburbs, and all of what's happening in reverse now. Right? That's not to say those people are horrible, awful people. Remember I said, our task is to say, could we just lower the temperature, the emotional temperature, and the need to feel attacked or personalize all of this, and say, we could look at this systemically. And there's all kinds of stuff that shows us how that came to be. Even, even things that, seem, might, that might seem as silly as, I often get asked, where are you from? And I say, oh, I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> and people say, no, where are you really from? And I said, no, I'm really from Wisconsin. <laughs> I was born in Wisconsin in a tiny farming town, right? But so even behind that, like it's sort, of, it's sort of comical, but the message behind that is that somebody like me is like a foreign exchange student who's supposed to leave at some point, right? You laugh, but I hope it's a knowing laugh, right? That Asian Americans are the perpetual foreigners, that we're always some, from somewhere else. But even that has historical roots. We could look at the Chinese Exclusion Act, we can look at gentlemen's acts that impacted Japanese Americans. And I'm not Chinese or Japanese, I'm Southeast Asian. My family came here with a totally different military and colonial experience in the 1970s. But I'm still lumped with those folks. I'm still, we are still lumped as a group because that's how race works. I don't get to choose. But even that individual experience of somebody saying, where are you really from? Or you speak English so well. <laughs> and I want to say to that white person, so do you. <laughs> Tell me your story, immigrant, right? Like all of that. <laughs> but you see that, like, it's, it's funny. Like, we can talk about race, it doesn't have to be this horrible thing. And then we can say, but what created that reality? Well, there were all kinds of laws and cultural norms of exclusion that created that reality. So I just want you to know very, very clearly, none of us woke up today. This is not happening, it's not changing. That's okay. None of us woke up today and discovered that racism is a problem. That's not really the case. That racism shapes us at the very deepest levels of our psyche. Systems and institutions shape how we behave. And most of us didn't even know it was happening and we sure as hell didn't give permission for it. But racism doesn't require your permission and racism doesn't require you to know. 
In fact, racism works really well when you don't know what's happening, when you don't know how you've been shaped into a system. If anybody has ever watched The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, it's like, which pill are you going to eat? Which one, are you going to wake up and know what's happening or not? And if you haven't watched The Matrix, you totally should. <laughs> and put on your, put on your like, institutional racism analysis glasses while you watch it, right? That, that's what happens to all of us. So that's why I say to folks, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at me when I behave in such a way that supports institutional racism, because that's what I was taught to do. People of color and white people alike. What irks me is when we know, and then we pretend we don't know anymore. Mm -hmm. We know. And most people, I would say most people know. I'll just scratch a little bit and most people know. The second thing here that I want you to be really aware of, again, historically created. These outcomes that we are experiencing now, it's like a domino. You can, you can trace a trail of dominoes that are all tipping over, and of course that 50th domino is going to tip. Of course it is. We can predict that. It's not that hard if we are honest about what's really happening. This is not about shame and blame. It's just telling the true story about race and our places in it. So when we think about then how do we disrupt this, then the real task is to say, OK, could we identify behaviors and norms that support institutional racism? Because behaviors and norms are the things we can change. Right? People are always like, racism's a construct. It's a, it's a pathology. It's an illness. And absolutely, it is. But how do you interrupt a pathology? If everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid and they don't know they're drinking the Kool-Aid, what are you going to do about the Kool-Aid? So that's very hard to change. What is easier to change, or easier to recognize, if you're willing, is the best of what I know from my own cognitive behavioral therapy, my therapist, I have a lot to thank for her for my work, right? is that if I can identify the behavior that is producing the outcome I don't like, then I can disrupt and change the behavior to produce a different outcome. We can do that individually. We can do that institutionally. We can do that as a community. And I have found that, quite honestly, when we choose to disrupt our behaviors together, challenge each other, offer each other graciousness, that we can produce really incredible things. There are cities across the country who are doing what we could be starting tonight. Cities like the city of Seattle, Kalamazoo, High Point, North Carolina. There are cities that are trying to figure out what is the citywide initiative where we interrupt our collective behavior to produce a different outcome in your church, in your nonprofit group, in your community group, in your family, in your school. Where do you have some place to agitate and disrupt some behavior? So with that, I want to turn this over to Sarah, who's going to help us look at the data and say, OK, What's real here, and then what's the story that tells us about institutional racism? Good luck. Hello. Hi. Wow. She's so good. Paku is a gem. Can we just give, like, another? Can you hear me? No, I'm seeing, like, shaking, like, no, I can't hear you. Is it like this? OK. I can also project. We were both theater people. You can, you'll be able to tell this um, as truth. I want to tell a story about Paku. We met five years ago in a kindergarten classroom. And our kids were starting together. My youngest, Paku's oldest. I had just moved here from California. And I made an offhand comment, what I thought was under my breath. I said something like, uh, institutional racism about a policy at the school. And she beelined to me like nobody's <laughs> business. She's like, we're going to be best friends. And we are best friends five years later. And that's what's so amazing about Kansas City is that I can be up here as a deputy at the health department alongside my best friend, who I've spent many late nights talking about things that have nothing to do with racism. We are not fun at parties, I will tell you. <laughs> we're like, did you know what they do in Thailand to shrimp farmers? Like every time we're at a cocktail party, it is not fun. Um, my name is Sarah. I am deputy at the health department. I am so blessed to be here, honored. I'm shaking. I'm shaking because also the mayor makes me very nervous. If anyone's ever seen a Casey stat, which is also fun, you should watch that too. Um, I feel like he spends a lot of time figuring out how to throw me off. Um, I may be just flattering myself, but I get very nervous, and so I'm trying not to look in that direction. So if I'm <laughs> favoring this side of the room, that's why. 
Um, I have notes, and I have this new phone, and it has to look at my face, like, to open. Um, I want to take this opportunity to ask city staff to stand up um, and be recognized. Uh, and it doesn't have to be health department staff. So if you could just stand up and wave city staff who took their time to be here. Um, I want you to know how much we think about this stuff. And bureaucrats get a bad rap, um, but this is the stuff that keeps us up at night. Every one of the city staff who stood up, um, I've had a conversation with about race. I've had conversations about power and about how to like undo, like our job is to undo the things that came before. Right? And so what I'm doing here today is to tell you that what you're going to see is not historical. It's not just like, oh, J.C. Nichols, that guy sucked. Like, this is like <laughs> decades, decades of inaction perpetuating historical injustices. And that's on me. That's on every person who just stood. Now they're sad they stood because now they're like, <laughs> trying really hard not to curse because we're on channel two. Kids are watching. Uh, some of you have seen this map before. Um, I grew up in Central California. My mother is Mexican. Another reason I love Paku, she was the first person in my life to say, you're a woman of color. I was like, what? Really? I racialized as white, right? I probably got up here like, oh, another white woman talking about race. Like, um, and I grew up in Central California. My mom grew up in LA. My dad is white. My mom grew up in LA at a time when they had this horrible thing called Operation Wetback, right? Which is a real thing the LAPD did where if you were speaking Spanish on the street, they could just throw you in advance. Kind of like stop and frisk, but with Spanish, right? And so her parents were like, you're American, like very hardcore, right? You do not speak Spanish. You will never learn Spanish. You will not be Mexican, though we will eat tamales. I make good tamales. I'm just saying, like, if you ever want to come over at the holidays, whatever <laughs> holiday that you uh, celebrate. So uh, I grew up, right, just, just very, like, identifying as white, right? And then one time in high school, I put eyeliner on. And I, like, wasn't, like, big into eyeliner. Like, I wasn't very good at it. Um, and so I put eyeliner on, and I walk out of the bathroom. My mom says, take that off. You look too Mexican. And I just remember, like, stomping, you know, like teenagers do, just like, I am Mexican, and between that point and meeting Paku was probably the, like two times of my identity pillars, right? Of being Mexican and not speaking Spanish, but because of the historical oppression where my mom grew up, it was what her parents did to survive, right? And I had to have some compassion around that and to have some understanding. So we're talking about history, but this is now. Does anyone know what this is? Oh, wow. I heard the music of people being like, life expectancy, right? So this is life expectancy by zip code. Is there anything special about a zip code? Not really, except you all know your zip code. I usually say, who knows their census tract? And only like city staff from the planning department like raise their hands, right? Um, so this life expectancy here is on average about 14 years different than the life expectancy in the lighter areas that you see. So if I drive from here to here, that's about like a seven minute drive, right? Down like 63rd Street. I gained 14 years in life expectancy. That, don't tell me that a shorter high quality life is better than a longer life. I will not believe you. 14 years sitting on your porch, hanging out with your grandkids, enjoying your later years, like that is the difference between this short drive. That's also a difference of about $20,000 in median income. And my job here was not to be like, here's a bunch of depressing statistics, <laughs> right? We put those in a special report, which I made for you, which lives online. So if you want to go read all of the reports by race, you can do that, right? So that's been tweeted out. We'll make sure it's on the website. We're going to make sure you all get it. This report that shows in majority black census tracts Every indicator indicates that even non-black people living in census tracts that are majority non-white are worse off. 
So what I'm here to tell you today is two things. This isn't historical, this is now, right? This is not an accident. We did not fall from a tree and land here and die earlier. I'm here to teach you why it happens. It isn't, it isn't because people are killing each other. That's happening too. A lot of this has to do with chronic diseases. What is the number one thing people die of in the city? I heard heart disease. That's one of them. No, cancer. Does that mean we all leave here and we say, I'm organizing a marathon for cancer research? No, right? It isn't because like, we can cure cancer. It's because we can prevent things. And it's also because the body knows what it's doing. And here's the, like, the science I want to tell you. What happens when like, a bear, like you meet a bear in the woods? Like, okay, so I'm like walking, I'm camping, which I'm not because I don't believe in camping. <laughs> My grandma said, I didn't pick, quote, she died of cancer, very young. She said, I did not pick grapes for you to go sleep in the woods. Like, you will get a hotel room. So like, there's like nuggets of wisdom I remember from my grandmother. What happens? Adrenaline. What happens to your body? Shout it out. Stress. Stress. Fight or flight, I heard. What did you say, Councilman Reed? I'm sorry. I think Councilman Reese said his palms get sweaty. I just put that in, I, got, I was like planted that right there. Um, so your body is doing stuff. You know, you get like all prickly when you're like met with stress. What is your body not doing when it's busy doing all that stuff? Fighting disease, keeping you healthy, breathing. All those things that happen in your body normally to fight diseases are not happening when you're busy reacting to stress. Now imagine that stress is every day. A lot of you in this room live that, have lived it, your kids live it. Coming to Kansas City was, even from Oakland, right? So I like, worked in Oakland, came here, I remember talking to a family where the kids would immediately, every time they walked in the living room in front of the big bay window, they would, do this every time in case a bullet came through the window. So we know just hearing bullets affects that body's ability to fight disease. And what do we do? Stop smoking. What do we do in public health? Right? Stop smoking. Don't drink that. Oh, those kids today and their opioids. Like we're always just like victim blaming, right? But just like my parents and your parents and their parents, it's survival. And your body's just trying to survive. So when you're in a dinner conversation, not with us, because our dinner conversations are not fun, but when you're in a dinner conversation and someone's like, those people need to stop doing that to their body, don't they know better? You tell them, you send them to me. And I will send them the research. And we've done this amazing brain scan research where people who grow up in poverty, you ask them to do a simple budget. Just like, simple budget. And they watch their brains. And they can't process logic in the same way because their brains are bruised by trauma. This is an individual choice, right? This isn't about all about personal responsibility. This is about, have we as city staff and community organizations made environments to where the best choice is the easiest choice? For some parts of town, yeah. I live downtown now. I can scooter myself. <laughs> I, don't let one, I don't let one speaking engagement go by without mentioning scooters and how much I love them. Rick Usher is here, that's why. Like I'm like, <laughs> keep those scooters because I use them all the time. I charge them too. I'm gonna go back to the, can I go back to the data real quick? I, and they're like, oh, she's got the data and you guys are like, oh, that's when I go to the bathroom. Like, I promise you, I'm like, not here to like, flood you. Um, but this is our life expectancy over time. So here's the second thing I want you to know when you leave here for your conversations. The winners lose too. 
So you may think segregation isn't all that bad for the people who are on the winning side of it. But time and again, the research says Kansas City is worse off than cities that are more integrated and more equal. So a guiding principle at the health department is it isn't just not having stuff. It's not just poverty. It's the fact that I don't have stuff and someone else has a hell of a lot of it. Because it is about power and balance. And that matters for all of us. Look at what's happening to our life expectancy nationally and in Kansas City. Did you know our maternal death rate is higher than it was 30 years ago? Did you know that affluent, educated black women are like five times more likely to die than poor white women in childbirth? We're not doing any better than we were before. And we're having like all these conversations, all this policy stuff, all this stuff happening, and people are getting richer. And now we have like five light or whatever. Like we're doing good as a city. <laughs> we're doing so good. And yet we can't do this, right? And this is the gap. This is actually something you should know about your city. You should be so proud. Our business plan, and if you are not familiar with our business plan, like you should be, the citywide business plan, which our council, God bless them, have passed with like objectives around life expectancy in it. I know no other city in this entire country whose business plan has an objective to close the gap between zip codes as a business plan objective. For a long time, we, the health department was charged with that until we had like a come to Jesus moment with the directors and we were like, got them in a room, we said, hey, we didn't do this, like we all need to fix this, right? But look at what's happening. Back in the day when we started measuring it, it was only 12.7 years and now it's up to 14.9. The bottom is getting worse, but the top is like gangbusters. They're gaining more at the top than the bottom is losing. And so we're like just seeing this like gap widen. And do we as a city believe that the people who need it the most deserve the most? And is that reflective in our policies? So when you leave here today and you decide, you know, am I gonna testify at that council meeting? Am I gonna vote? Am I gonna get involved in my neighborhood association? I want you to think about if you believe that your actions reflect the principles of who needs it the most gets the most. This is our racial gap. This is actually the data that started the Mayor's Health Commission. So you'll go out there and you'll see some tables of some amazing community groups, but I also want you to think about whether you're willing to serve on a community advisory committee for the Mayor's Health Commission. Maybe you want to try to get a board appointment, right, to somewhere where they actually like make resource allocation recommendations to council. The Health Commission was founded because of this gap here in this very year. There is an 8.8 .8 year life expectancy difference between black and white men in this city. And for the first time in the data, black women are living less than white men. And usually, women overall do better. But this is the first time it's actually flipped. And so these are the conversations we need to continue, not just in our grassroots organizations or like not just in your neighborhood associations, but in like policy making. I want to see you there because we tend to see the same people over and over. I want to see some new people. Is that me? That's it? I'm done? Wait, let me look at my stopwatch. I, I started a stopwatch. You guys, I was like really trying to be responsible here because I thought, you know, I can't ruin this. I can't ruin this for the mayor. Um, so here's what's going to happen. <laughs> So um, I want you to know that as a city staff member, I am here for you. My stats team is amazing. And if there is like actual like research you want done on your neighborhood or your zip code or you know wherever you live and the people that you care about, like we are here for you to do that. Um, Javon, where's Javon? Raise your hand higher, please. Uh, Javon is staff support for the Mayor's Health Commission, and if you're interested in potentially serving on an advisory group to that commission that makes recommendations, did you know that there are millions and millions of property tax dollars that go to support health? Like, you're paying it, 
right? And you might want to have a say in where that goes. And so Javon can help you get connected uh, to that way of getting involved as well. So I think what we're going to do now is wrap it up, and then we're going to go into some Q&A. So I'm going to let Dia take back over. Thank you for giving me this time. I appreciate it. Did you have any idea that somebody at the health department was so dynamic? So at this time, we're going to get ready for some Q&A. Before we bring our panel up, a quick reminder, you got those note cards if you want to write those questions. They're collecting those if you have some questions you'd like to get in. Twitter, at Mayor Sly James. Again, not me. Don't search Dia Wall because you will not get a response. But at Mayor James, we've got some people filtering through those as well. And then we're going to have a few mics roaming through the audience. So if you want to ask your questions, you can do that as well. So at this time, Mayor Sly James. Paku Her and Dr. Sarah Martin. Our esteemed panel is going to take their seats. So staff is going to be walking around collecting those questions, note cards, going through tweets. If you're on the live stream, I'm sure you can comment there as well. So I'm going to kick us off, if that's all right. This is a good one. For people who would like to dive a little bit deeper, really make an impact in the city, what are some things they can do? Oh, that's for me? You know we're both gonna look at you like every time there's a question. We're just gonna go to you and first. Mayor? Yes, please. Your thoughts? Proceed. Gee, why not? <laughs> um, I, I, first of all, I agree with Dr. Martin that there are a number of different boards and commissions that we have. Uh, we very definitely encourage women particularly to uh, apply uh, through the Women's Foundation, through the Appointments Project, uh, where we have worked with women to elevate the status of women in boards and commissions. I think that's extremely important. The other thing that I think that if, it, you know, not everything flows through the city, okay? But if you're truly interested in it, then there's a bunch of people out there you should talk to because they're actually on the ground level. There's a number of organizations. Talk to the people on the ground level about what they do. Uh, support the things that you believe in. Uh, uh, Pre-K, you want to talk about closing gaps? Quality pre-K is a gap closer. It also has an impact on longevity. It has an impact on health. It has an impact on earnings. It has an impact on what zip code you live in. It has an impact on a whole lot of different stuff. There's a number of different ways to engage. Uh, I would start with the people in the hall. I would talk to Javon. I would talk to uh, the Women's Foundation. I would call our office and talk to uh, Larissa and Jim do boards and commission work. And they will tell you the process of making your names known so that we can find places to sort you. And then on the other thing, there is absolutely nothing from stopping you from having friends that don't look like you to your house to have a conversation. There is nothing that stops you from going out to dinner with somebody who doesn't look like you, uh, maybe a friend at work that you never actually talked to except at work, and starting a conversation. All of these things are within your own power. I, I would add, my lab is still on, right? Um, I would add, one of the things that I would encourage people to do, thank you, Dia, is to pause for a minute. If you are feeling really excited, really jazzed, and you want to plug in somewhere, to stop for a moment and ask yourself, what are you capable of doing? Where do you have time and energy? How much do you have? I mean, I'm the mom of two very demanding children. I mean, as if children are just generally demanding. But, um, but I have to take that into account, right? When I say, what, where, what do I want to do? And where do I need to go? You may say, OK, there's some stuff that I need. You might say, actually, there's stuff that my organization or the place where I work we have some needs. Those might be training and skill building needs in order to have these conversations. Like, and I will say with a caveat, I have been a trainer for 20 years. You cannot educate racism away. You cannot train it away. Right? Like if we could just do enough trainings and get people woke, then we'd be great and it'd be done and we'd have had this thing licked a long time ago. That actually isn't the goal. But if people need education in order to take action, if people need technical skills in order to do something, then you may discover that's actually where we need to start. Like your organization, your workplace may not be ready yet for like the big strategic launch because 
if you want to set yourselves up for success, you have to back up and say, well, what are all the preconditions that we need to have in place in order for that theory for big success here to work? And so that might mean you pause for a minute and say, what, is, what are my real needs? What am I capable of doing? Or we, what are our needs and our capability? And then assess how to connect with people there. Sarah, I got a question for you. Or Dr. Martin, which do you prefer? Sarah is fine. Sarah, I feel Doc, like you, you know. We all know I'm a doctor at this point. <laughs> yeah, I try. Are there any climate or environmental factors affecting those zip code disparities? Can you repeat that? I didn't hear the beginning because I was laughing at this. Okay. Are there any climate yes. or environmental factors that yes. affect those zip code disparities? Absolutely. Um, so we can talk climate from you know, a, a climate of access to healthy foods, access to transportation, um, but there's also actual like climate resilience issues happening in a lot of our zip codes and a lot of it is tied to like blight, right? Abandoned buildings. Um, I have the distinct honor of getting every 311 call that comes into the health department into a special email box. And when I look at things like rats, Lead, mold, those are concentrated in our already most vulnerable zip codes. And I am so passionate about mold. There's nothing like more scary to me than pictures of mold because what mold does, right, is like 40% of our kids' like asthma out of school days are triggered by indoor allergens. And a lot of folks in those areas don't feel like empowered to actually either make a complaint against maybe a landlord or don't have the resources to actually do some rehabilitation for their homes. And so, yes, and we have this like crazy stuff happening in some of our zip codes with heat islands. So when we talk about our most vulnerable folks like living on the street, they're actually living in places that are like 10 degrees hotter than other places because climate change, as we know, is affecting like our most vulnerable communities first before everyone else who's allowed to be more resilient. So yes, yes, and yes, I'm gonna take you over to the report. I'm gonna say, go interact with our data and whoever asked that question, if you want some more research, like get with me and we will make that happen. What are some ways to make people more comfortable talking about really big issues like systems, some that you addressed tonight? Most people wanna talk about the symptoms rather than the disease. Yes. Um, I find that people are hungry for conversations but don't have the skill to have them. Like they don't know how to have them. So oftentimes if you give people just one simple tool for engagement, like a common definition, like um, a shared approach, um, and you get people to, just, to commit, to really willfully commit to actively lowering the temperature, or assessing like, if I'm feeling triggered and I wanna yell at somebody because I think they're wrong, could I stop that and choose to engage differently? Um, over and over and over. And I've worked with groups where um, organizations and institutions that have for years tried to have conversations about race. And, they're, you know, and oftentimes these institutions are like, well, our intentions are really good. We mean well, we really mean well. It's not about intention. You measure race and racism by outcome. And if we can get people to like, depersonalize some of that, and if we can get people to have level conversation about that, then you can make huge strides, but it means people need the skill to do that, right? And I don't mean that in a patronizing way. Like, most of the time, we don't have the skills both to be deeply self-reflective, we don't have the cognitive behavioral skills to choose a different neural pathway, right? because our neural pathways get triggered and shaped. So I get real used to being angry the minute somebody talks about racism. Rightfully so. I'm not saying people shouldn't be angry about institutional racism. But in order to have a productive conversation with people who are at lots of different levels of understanding and comprehension, there's also something that I have to choose around changing the neural pathway until I can find another one that isn't quite so worn. It's like a deer path through the forest. It's familiar to me. So I, like, I can speak from personal experience. I spent many years of my life going from zero to 60, immediately raging, 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 talking about race. And it doesn't mean that that wasn't an important developmental time in my life, but it became clear that that wasn't a strategy for long-term transformative change with people who are coming in at lots of different places. If the goal, if the goal is to move the body of people or a community together with some kind of way of being coalesced together, not everybody has to be in the exact same place, but those are fairly critical pieces. Common definition, 
similar framework, um, and a way in which we can cool our brains down enough. The science also shows this. If we can cool our brains down enough to have a conversation, then we're less likely to be reactive or um, to weaponize the, the things that we're feeling. A lot of questions about economic development. So I'm going to kick this one to you, Mayor. Um, Closing the economic and housing gap. What are some ways to do that? One additional question, it appears the life expectancy map and the map for the one-eighth cent sales tax for economic development kind of overlap. So what impact do you envision the revenue from the tax having to close some of those gaps between the zip codes? I would be premature in trying to offer um, a guess as to how that's going to happen because I haven't seen the projects that they're going to undertake yet. I think that any time, I think there's one major thing that will help, and that is that it may actually create more hope, and hope is in and of itself a very positive thing. Uh, if people have a positive outlet, think something's going to happen, and they're looking forward to it, that's better than thinking nothing's going to happen and we're going to be stuck in this rut forever. So I would think that that's the first thing, but in terms of actual projects, I cannot say because I don't know what those projects are going to be. It will help. One of the things about economic development that people really do need to understand, in my opinion, is that economic development does not happen simply because you say, ah, there's a spot, let's do some economic development. Somebody has to be willing to make an investment. And investments are based on returns on investments. So when you have an area that is depressed economically and the return on investment is not viewed as being sufficient to offset the expense and the cost and the risk of making the investment when you could otherwise invest funds elsewhere, then that investment does not go there. The one ASIN sales tax will help level that out because there will be funds there to offset some of the investments. One of the reasons we do incentives is to encourage investments. Investments in economically depressed areas uh, for pioneers, as I like to call them, are generally at the top of every line of investment. 100% tax abatement, 100% TIF, 100% 357, or whatever the other things there are, 100s, whatever the case is. Because it takes that to get people to go and make the investment of their own funds because now they've got a cushion that will offer them a reasonable return. You have to build that first pioneer group. Others will then follow. Good example, not quite what you're thinking, but a good example is Rieger Distilleries down in the East Bottoms. They moved down there, made a huge investment in an area that nobody thought was going to ever see any investment. All of a sudden, they're making more investments and other people are making investments with them. There has to be a, a pioneer to bring the rest of the wagon train down the trail and into the area. That's what's going to happen, I hope, with the one in sales. We've already started trying to trigger that with the investments on Prospect and some investments on Truce to eliminate some of the issues there. It, it's a long, slow process, but it's starting, and it needs to continue. Sorry, there's a delay. For all of you, if there was one thing that you wanted people to take away, one thing that you believe will be a game changer in this city, in this community, what would it be? I'll start. Um, something I've learned, we have a couple health department employees here, Carolyn and Simone, wave. They are the brave souls who took on this issue within the health department. And I've learned a lot from them. And I think we've learned a lot from some missteps that we might have taken where we, we went too fast. And what we didn't start with was for those of us like in a dominant either position, race, gender, could we just shut up a minute like, and let other people talk? And, and I feel like if there's anything, which is funny because I just talked for like many minutes. <laughs> um, I don't think I'd ever really listened. And what I also don't think I was good at was apologizing. And I think as a city staff, as a government employee, even if I didn't do the things that might have created these inequities, I owe the city and the people my work and responsibility as like contrition, as an apology for the things that have happened before. And personally, I have to know how to apologize and not expect forgiveness. And that is like the next level stuff, right? Which is like, you know how you apologize to your partner and you're like, when are they gonna say I'm forgiven, right? Like we can't wait around for that because it might never come and that's okay too. And that's like my, my burden, right? Um, so that's what I hope people take away. And I hope people, and I will likely not be with you in your next conversations, I'll be out in the audience with you.
but I hope that you, like, this is a continued commitment to self-improvement. That's what this is. This is like betterment of yourselves, and I hope that you just leave feeling very proud of yourselves and your seatmates for doing this. So I'll let, I'll let you take this one. My hope when you leave here is that you feel like there is something you can do. There is something you can do. And I, I think that's, mo that's really critical because in the way for us to create some culture change around race and talk about race is to talk about race, right? Like uh, I said to Sadia yesterday, we were, talking, we were chatting and I said, you know, people think talking about race is racist. It isn't. It's not racist to talk about race, right? We, can, we keep race in place and we pretend it's not a thing. And then it gets to operate behind the scenes and create all kinds of sense of inequity and damage relationships and hurt communities because we are too afraid to talk about it because we're like, oh, God, we're going to be racist if we say something about whiteness or we say something about what people of color are experiencing. That my hope is that you know that there's something you can do, not just to have the conversation, but that the conversation has meaning for changing the culture of Kansas City, for normalizing a conversation about race. We can destigmatize it by having it. And maybe that's scary to you. Maybe that's scary to you because that might threaten your position in your job. Maybe that's scary to you because your grandmother will never talk to you again. Maybe, maybe all of those things. And if we're immobilized by fear, then nothing's gonna change. And there are lots of ways in which you can be supported in the doing of this conversation, in the doing of this practice as a community. So that it isn't just what stays in a, conver like, you know, a side conversation we can have at a dinner nobody else wants to be at because we're depressing. But, it has bigger impact to see yourselves as people who can create change. I was talking with some of the mayor staff as we were preparing for this, and I said, you know, there's all these grassroots groups. We are on top of November. We are on top of midterm elections. We are on top of 2020. We are on top of lots of places where we could be raising up conversations about race, where you could be an agent saying, if I'm going to go volunteer on this campaign, or I'm going to volunteer at my church, or I'm, gonna, I'm, can, I'm just going to raise it. And I'm going to see, could I be the person who says the thing that everybody's afraid to say? And you don't have to know exactly what the outcome is going to be. But to be brave enough to exist in that liminal space and choose actively to normalize it. Choose actively to be the leader who will name something that everybody's too afraid to name. Well, I just hope that everybody leaves here tonight and then has a conversation at home tonight or tomorrow with somebody who wasn't here and says, I was just in a long conversation about race and I wasn't defensive, I wasn't upset. Uh, there were a whole lot of people that didn't look like me. Nobody was hurtful, harmful. And I wanna go back and do this again and learn more. That's what I hope. Because I really do think that at the end of the day, uh, this is a process of us becoming familiar with the definition of racism as race prejudice uh, and the misuse of institutional power and systems uh, that lead to racial inequality. I think if, that, if we can all look at that definition, then we can all say, what am I doing to either contribute to that system or disrupt that system? And the first thing is getting to know people who are affected by that system. And what I've learned here tonight is, is that everybody is affected by that system. Whether you're white, black, purple, or green, whether you're rich or poor, everybody is poor until the lowest get richer. And that's what we have to do. So this one's for Sarah. What are some preventative measures women of color can take to decrease mortality rates when it comes to childbirth? I want to. I want to say uh, what I asked. What I told the city manager when he asked that question, and I was also on Channel Two, and then I got in trouble afterwards. Say it. I said, "Be white." Like so. Uh, that. Um, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take that question. I'm gonna flip it. What can healthcare providers do? to better serve women of color in their childbirth journeys. I'm gonna turn that around and say, what are medical schools doing to teach culturally competent medical care? And we ask people, we ask people, why didn't you get prenatal care? You know you should. Why didn't you get mental health care? And time and again, we hear from community members because my doctor just doesn't get it. Or I walked in and I felt like 
a criminal. When I was pregnant with my second child, they asked me, do you drink? I was like, well, I had a glass of wine uh, like a couple weeks ago. It was great. I mean, I was like seven months pregnant, you know? And they're like, you need to go talk to a social worker. I was like, what? Social worker? I go down there. It is full of black women. And I started talking to people, and they're like, yeah, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. They said I was high risk. I was like, why? They're like, I don't know, I have a job, I got prenatal care. I was like, I know exactly why. I know exactly why. And so if we're not teaching our providers to actually listen, what I just said, shut up and listen, and don't, and don't think you know better than your patient, and don't put your ideals of what childbirth should look like on your patients. They want to have an unmedicated birth, they want a doula, they want three generations of people in the room, they want it loud, they want to eat, they want to sit up and not lay down. Did you know that if you have been traumatized, especially sexual abuse in childhood, there's a list of things that trigger you. Bright lights, weird smells, filling out paperwork over and over again, having to explain your situation to lots of different people in a row. Does that sound familiar? Like to me, as someone who's had a child in like a westernized medical facility, that's literally childbirth. Breastfeeding. Oh, you should breastfeed. And then we go a touching on people and like helping them do it without asking their permission, right? Like that's the way, that's what I want us to leave here thinking, not what can I do to be healthy because I'm doing it already. Like what can you do to help me? I think that's the question we should be asking here. One more round of applause for our panel. Thank you all for your questions. We got so many. Thank you to the people who tweeted the mayor. We got some of those in, who passed around the note cards. Your input, your questions, those answers are valuable for all of us. Thank you. At this time, we're going to thank our ladies and have Mayor James come and close us out. Okay, so here we are. Uh, we began this conversation as a community to talk about these issues tonight. And I recognize that for most of us, we'll all be going back to work tomorrow fresh with some new ideas in our heads and hopefully, hopefully feeling inspired to actually do something. Um, really though, this is not designed to be a one-time thing. Uh, that's not what we're here for. We want to continue to talk. We want to continue to meet. We want to continue to grow. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Two things. Number one, first of, all, first of all, realize that you have a lot of power. Every single one of us has power uh, through our responsibilities, through the people that we touch. Uh, we must be conscious of, how we, of the things that we do to perpetuate and uphold the norms of the systems in which we live every single day. In the few fair, uh, square feet of space that we occupy, all of us can find some way to make our community a little bit better. Uh, then we can begin to make greater changes in the homes and organizations, workplaces, uh, schools, businesses, and, and the communities that we live that are gonna be more enduring. So realize you have power. And part of that power that you need to realize is the power of how you spend your money and where you spend your money. Uh, there are a lot of people who make a lot of money trying to figure out how to get you to buy the stuff that they want you to buy. Um, I would say to some extent, if, if it feels like it's something that people want you to buy, it's probably something you shouldn't. Uh, and, and it's probably something that if you do want to buy it, you should look for a different place to buy it than the ones that you already uh, currently shop at. And all of that power and the use of that power starts with each and every one of us. Second. The second thing I want you to do is come back. Come back and talk about it. Let's talk, take this to another level. Let's have another conversation different than this one. October 16th at the Mohart Center, uh, we'll be doing this again. Uh, make sure to follow up with CARE on social media or sign up for their newsletter and they will, they're gonna play a huge role in, in the conversations that we have going forward and they've already done that. Uh, you can sign up to volunteer, to attend trainings, to receive resources, to read. You can go to the website and you can see the reports that Dr. Martin and the health department have put together. Believe me, if you are a data nerd, 
uh, you will have all sorts of fun. And if you're not, you will learn things that you will say, I had no idea. Those reports, the, uh, the programs that they do, the data they collect is absolutely astounding and is something that we should all be familiar with. You can also continue to have conversations. Just because you came here and you turned and you met some people you may not have known before, no reason to have that conversation stop. No reason to have any conversation stop. Make an effort to get out of your comfort zone and see something that you haven't seen, do something you haven't done with people you don't normally do it with. The last thing is, is I really want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for uh, committing to tonight. Uh, I want to once again thank Paku and Dr. Martin for the work that they have done. You've been outstanding. I am sorry, Dr. Martin, I will not ask you hard questions anymore <laughs> at KC Stat until the next one. I have, uh, she's, uh, she's, this woman has uh, uh, done quite a bit uh, in my opinion, to raise the awareness of these issues with the data she's collected and the way that she's presented. So she's a unique person. Paku has been absolutely super. I wish I was as calm as she was sometimes. Um, I definitely want to make sure to thank my staff again because they worked their tails off on this. Uh, they worked very hard and it was over an extended period of time. What you're seeing is the culmination of months of work. A lot of that work started with research and talking to tons of people and getting training themselves. And one other thing I want to tell you, in the city, we're already doing something. We're already organizing our groups. We're organizing our departments. We have people from our departments coming together that are going to look at the systems in which they work and operate to figure out where we can stop some of these issues from occurring and, and disrupt ourselves because we can't ask you to do it if we're not doing it and we're in the process of doing it. So hopefully as we do it, we may have information to share, some maybe some do's and some don'ts, maybe some here's what we found, some eye openers, and we'll be happy to share those if and when they become available. But I want you to know, we're walking the walk that we're talking, and we want to make sure that we're setting the pace and modeling the behavior as much as we possibly can. We're gonna be helter skelter a little bit, we're gonna make some mistakes but we're always gonna be trying to do things that are gonna better the situation. And as long as we're trying hard to do the right thing, we'll succeed more than we fail. Thank you for being here. Dia. So I know we've had a lot of asks of you tonight, but there's just one more. You've got surveys. We really need you to fill those out. The city is asking for you to do that. As the mayor mentioned, there are gonna be future conversations. This is the first one out of the starting gate, right? So they want your feedback to help them improve and continue to grow this program and take the city in the direction that you all want it to go in. We wanna thank you for being here. We know this isn't easy and you've dedicated hours of your time to come share in ways that you can help make this city a better place for all of us. With that, have a good night, everybody.